Um, hello, Analysis 1A. Um, hello, Internet. This is day one of, um, of calculus class. And um, so, let's get started. All right. Uh, Alice, um, we're in calculus. I want to talk about calculus. Calculus is really great. And so, um, before we get started, some of you might know some things, but most of you probably don't know anything about calculus. So, um, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it is. Uh, what we're going to be doing in this class, how this class works, and just like get you just like the pumps of the semester. All right, so um, Raymond, what is calculus? This is a question. It's a difficult question to answer, uh, and uh, it's uh, a question which can be answered in a bunch of different ways. Um, so one answer to what is calculus? All right, it is a it is a collection of advanced techniques. So okay, when people say when people talk about calculus, they're referring to just this wide um, variety of mathematical techniques for solving certain kinds of problems. Okay, that's a little bit of a boring answer. Um, another uh, another way of, of of talking about calculus, it is it is the analysis of infinitely large and infinitely small quantities. So anytime you find yourself in math. Um, looking at things which are infinitely small, whatever that means, or infinitely large, whatever that means, then you're basically doing some kind of calculus. Um, and um, you might be thinking right now, uh, hey, Mr. Rose, um, haven't we been like doing lots of stuff already with infinitely large? I mean, you've certainly the concept of infinity has certainly come up in this class already with like you know asymptotes and like all kinds of things like that, right? You can't graph rational functions without talking about uh, infinitely small and infinitely large quantities. And so, in a sense, uh, we have been doing kind of calculus already. We've been doing sort of baby calculus or informal calculus. Um, and uh, how, to, how to correctly uh, and carefully analyze infinitely small and infinitely large quantities. That's, like what, we're, that's what we're going to learn when we do calculus. And I should remark that like, um, right, it is probably a good idea, if you're, if you're uh, an, an excellent pre-calculus teacher, Eo, would have been sprinkling throughout pre-calculus these kinds of uh, these kinds of calculus concepts. So you might already you should already somehow feel uh, maybe that you have kind of heard of all these things before. They should already sort of be they should be like ready there for you to like kind of grab. All right. So um, the analysis of infinitely large and infinitely small quantities. In fact, um, that is why uh, in a lot of other countries uh, or in college that they call calculus analysis. That's and that's actually why this this class is called analysis one a more or less just to be obnoxious. I feel like that is the only reason why it's called that. Um, but uh, but just be aware that like I think I think in the UK they they, they don't call it calculus. They call it analysis. Oh, and uh, by the way, even just the title calculus um, is I I'm sort of making some of this stuff up. I think it's true um, that um, that uh, when people say calculus, it's actually shorthand for uh, sort of like the calculus of infinitesimals. So. Literally, it is the calculus of, in other words, how to calculate with infinitely large and small quantities. All right. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing this class is, um, I was going to read my paper. It is a coherent body of definitions and theorems that can be used to answer a wide variety of questions about functions. Uh, in other words, what we're going to be doing a lot in this class is zooming in, sort of inf infinitely in, looking at some tiny little piece of a function, infinitely small intervals, and also zooming out and looking at kind of like infinitely large intervals. Um, all right. So, all right. Logically, this class is also structured differently from pre-calc. Uh, in the sense that um, pre-calc, uh, we kind of just like did a bunch of stuff, you know? It's like we learned something, and especially pre-calc C, um, we learned something, and we like, learned something else, and we learned something else. They didn't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Um, calculus, on the other hand, is going to be a lot more like a geometry class, um, uh, or, or like, like the geometry class you took, or uh, like the geometry class that in my imagination you all took, the, the, high, the extremely high quality geometry class that I will pretend that you all took, um, in which you will recall, hopefully, from your geometry class, that um, everything you did kind of was, was, was cumulative, right? In the, you know, in the very beginning of the year, probably, like, you know, you'd like, and you had certain conversations about geometry, and then you defined certain terms very precisely, and then you had like axioms, stuff, just not if you have some vague recollection of this. All right. Yeah, so there were like axioms, and then you use those axioms um, to like, you know, play around with objects, and you make conjectures, and then you like prove theorems, and you proved not vigorously. Yeah, you like proved theorems like, you know, from, from your axioms, 
Um, and then basically what would happen is, in, in, in a class like this, it's like you would, have a, you would have a theorem that the whole class would sort of prove, you know, together, whatever, or the teacher would do it, or you'd all do it together. And then that became like kind of a public declaration, like, all right, yo, we have this theorem now. And then uh, you'd have to like know those theorems and remember them and, and, and know like what they mean and when they can be applied. And then slowly throughout the year you would like build and you would learn new things and you'd prove new theorems and you'd be citing the old theorems. So this class is going to be like that. Um, there are various uh, things in calculus which we're going to explore. We're going to conjecture, we're going to prove them, and now that becomes a theorem and we're going to just like use it over and over again and kind of build and build and build. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, calculus is also amazing. Um, it is really, really, really fun. Um, Kendall, <coughs> calculus, it's really great. It's going to blow your mind. Every day you're going to be leaving. Who has um, quadrato next period? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Um, Can I make it a summer? You're going to be late every single day. She already um, told our class Ro that she said... Not because I let you out late, Rohan. I'm going to let you out on time, but Rohan, you're going to be sitting in the... You're going to take two steps out the door, and then you're just going to kind of like crouch in the fetal position in the hallway, <laughs> um, just thinking like... Oh my God! What just happened? My mind is blown, and you're just gonna start thinking about calculus. You're just gonna black out. You're gonna wake up 15 minutes later, and it's gonna be like the middle of ninth period, and then you're gonna have to just like trudge on to the Spanish class and scream that um, every day. Um, every day that's gonna happen. Um, so, um, so you only have me once every two days. Yeah. Well, it's so okay. So, um, so. Every class that's going to happen, and um, I think, I think, um, I mean, I'm only slightly exaggerating. You know, you might just be going home and just talking about calculus every night at dinner, at dinner with your parents. Like this, this is, this is, I think this happens every year. Um, in fact, um, Robbie Fleischman, um, some students like almost get angry with me. Like, uh, I teach them something, and they're just like, Mr. Rose, how could you not have told me about this before? This seems so important. The fact that I'm like already like 16 years old or whatever, and you're just telling me this now? Like, what have you been waiting for? Like, that's some people have that reaction. Um, all right. Um, the other thing is, um, this class is pretty hard. I think calculus is pretty hard. Um, you have to think all the time. Um, Non-stop thinking. Get hard. Non-stop thinking. In pre-calc, sometimes, let's be perfectly honest. In pre-calc, I didn't want to tell you this while you were still in the class, but now that it's over, I can tell you the secret. Half of the time in pre-calc, you can kind of just like get a problem and just like, I feel like I've kind of like seen something like this before. And you just kind of like think for like a couple seconds, and then like you kind of set up some equation. You just sort of zone out, and then you just kind of do a bunch of stuff, and you get pretty much to the end of the page, and you're like, wait, what am I doing again? And then you kind of like then you kind of like start thinking, like I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, done with the problem. Um, so um, calculus is not like that. There's non-stop thinking. You have to think at every level. You have to think. You have to be constantly. Th I, I, in my in my opinion, uh, every single part of the experience requires actually like kind of thought and comprehension of like of what's really going on. And the more you think about it, the the more you'll get out of it. Um, in fact, I have this student. Um, his name. Uh, I tell the story every single year. Even though this kid is now graduated for like five years. Um, this kid who uh, this kid uh, this kid Tiago, who um, he was in my I used to teach uh, ninth graders, and he was in my uh, my ninth grade pre calc class. He did uh, really really well. It was like. A, a student got everything right all the time, and then uh, he came to calculus and he started like doing really badly. And like you know, months went by. And I'm like, what what's going on with this kid? How could he be doing so so badly? He was like the smartest kid freshman year. And I had, finally had like a heart to heart with him, and um, like two months in, and I kind of was like, Tiago, what's going on? And he's like, he's like, yeah. Um, he's like, yeah. I'm like, you did so well pre calc. He's like, yeah, pre calc. Uh, you kind of just plug it in. This is a quote, which I'll never forget. Um, so, 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 um, so, these famous words um, of Tiago Shejan, or whatever you pronounce his last name, if you're out there somewhere, um, pre-calc, you kind of just plug it in. Um, could go on like a poster somewhere. Um, so I understand what he was getting at, though, which is to some extent in pre-calc, you kind of do just plug it in. You have some formulas, and you kind of just plug it in. I actually I disagree with that. Uh, with that um, with that opinion, but I see where he's coming from. Calculus, by contrast, um, you have to think all the time. All right. Um, what else? Um, calculus is a story. Uh, this class is going to proceed along a rich narrative arc. Um, so, Butis, um, this class is going to have all those things that like good stories have. Um, have a, there's going to be an introduction that's going to start in about five minutes, um, and this introduction. Uh, the introduction to calculus is going to have, it's going to be like, like the credit sequence in a the movie. There's going to be heavy flash, 
flash forwarding. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Flash forwarding. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. <laughs> foreshadowing. Yeah, I knew that was wrong. Thank you. Um, yeah, foreshadowing. There's going to be heavy foreshadowing. Um, and then um, there is going to be some drama. And uh, there will be like conflict. And uh, what do you guys call it in this class? Like rising tension or something rising like that? Rising action. Rising action. <laughs> there's going to be rising action. And there'll be certain there'll be certain problems which like arise. Aha, how will we deal with this problem? And then we will deal with it. And then it will cause new problems. And then there'll be, so the things are going to just build and grow and build and grow and build and grow. And then um, this class is going to have a um, dramatic climax. And that dramatic climax is going to happen around uh, May 10th. And around May 10th, suddenly, it is, it is. Suddenly, the various strands of the course are going to come together into just an explosion that's just going to be incredible and blow your mind and change your life. Uh, and, um, uh, and then there will be like all good stories. There will be some like, you know, there'll be like a denouement, you know, afterward, where we kind of like pick up the pieces and try to figure out like what it all means and try to understand uh, the implications and then kind of like learn a couple other things. And then, then the semester will be over. So unlike really any other math class probably you've ever had or ever will have, there is there's like a dramatic story and flow to this class. So in some ways, no, it's better than pick up. Everything is kind of like seems like important, basically. Um, the other thing is it's important not to ruin the story for others. Um, so please identify yourselves now if you are one of those people that are always three or four each year who have just like taught themselves calculus just like off on the side because you just like read the internet or like did something like that. Maybe there's no one in this room. Maybe you, no, no, okay. All right, so please, if you happen to know something that you weren't supposed to know yet, don't like ruin it for other people by like blurting it out. Like everyone needs to have their own, you know, unique um, uh, kind of learning experience where they appreciate it um, anew. Uh, okay, so that's a thing. Um, the other thing that's important, uh, okay, in addition, to, in addition to this class kind of proceeding, uh, uh, this class being kind of like a story, um, calculus is a story, the history of calculus is a story. I feel that it's really important to understand the history of a subject um, to really understand it, and I think this is especially true with calculus. So, um, yeah, so, so where did calculus come from? All right, again, I'm sorry, Internet. Um, I'm just going to say something that I'm not really totally sure if they're true or not, but, uh, you know, they, they sound good. So someone, <laughs> someone fact check this if it's not totally accurate, but this is, like, somewhat accurate. At least this is the, this is the classic telling of this. Um, the classic telling of this story is um, calculus was invented by Isaac Newton. And, uh, oh, who's that's Isaac Newton? Over on the, on the thing. Um, so Isaac Newton... Uh, invented calculus, and here's the story goes like this. He was trying to solve physics problems. He was trying to solve certain physics problems, and uh, he got stuck. He got stuck because he didn't know enough math. Uh, and he didn't know enough math to solve his physics problems because the math was just not discovered yet. Uh, and so, in order to successfully complete these physics problems, he just invented the, ma the math that was required to do the physics. Uh, and this math is calculus. So, um, and he literally just like, there was like a plague. He was in London, he was really rich. There was like a plague, and one of those like plagues were like, no one was like bathing, and rats just blah, 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 blah. And, like one third of the, one third of the population was like dying. Um, and in order to, uh, in order to avoid the plague, um, he was really rich, so he uh, left the city, went off into the countryside for like a year. And during that year, he just discovered calculus. And, uh, and there's a whole, there's a bunch more history, which, we, which we'll get to like a different day. Um, so, the point of this, I guess, is that um, calculus was invented for a particular reason. It was invented to solve physics problems. Uh, and uh, to that extent, uh, calculus, and you, you can't, I think you can't understand calculus unless you understand the motivation of the people, what they were actually trying to do, what they were trying to accomplish. And there is a rich interplay between uh, calculus concepts and physics concepts. In fact, they're almost the same thing. Um, and thus, we will be doing lots of physics examples, as we'll be seeing in a second, because um, these are, in some cases, the examples which originally motivated the, the calculus concepts. And also, uh, Matteo, uh, in the future, when you take a calculus-based uh, physics class, which almost all serious physics classes assume that you've, that you've already, taken pre -calc or already taken calculus as a prereq, um, you will find that um, the very concepts themselves of modern physics are, are defined with calculus concepts built into, built into these physics concepts. Is there anyone who's taking physics, like AP physics, like this year? Okay. All right. All right. So that was like the intro to the intro. 
Uh, and now comes the uh, now comes the actual. Now we're going to actually have our introductions calculus. All right. So um, now at the point where I would like take start like taking notes, or whatever. If I were you guys. All right. So um, what are we doing in this class? What are we doing in calculus? Well, it's like this. Uh, calculus. There are two problems of calculus, uh, and uh, if you solve these two problems, then you've sort of like done calculus. It's like the it's like the it's like the four questions at a Passover seder or something like that, right? Um, the two questions of zero. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, wait. Um, doesn't matter. You say Passover? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to pose two questions and then we're going to then we're going to solve them. And if we've successfully answered these two solved these two these two problems, then we've sort of done calculus. And we're going to do that this semester. All right. The first problem uh, is uh, the area problem. Okay. And the area problem, roughly speaking, is a problem that says um, find the area of stuff. Uh, so can you tell me what is like the simplest thing, the simplest possible object that you know how to find the area of? Let's like shout some stuff out. Square. 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 Yeah, I feel like square is like the simplest. And in fact, you might even say uh, the unit square, the square of side length one. Um, uh, so what is the area of a square of side length one? You know, it's like one, right? It's like one square unit. You might almost say that this is like the definition of area or something like that. Um, that area kind of means, you know, how many squares of side length one can you fit into that region or something like that. Uh, okay, supposing I know, and by the way, once I know, uh, so maybe this is like an axiom of area or something like that. Uh, once I know how to find the area of squares of side length one, I might try to explore like, you know, bigger squares and stuff. So how about squares of side length three? How might I discover the area of a square of side length 3 if I know the area of a square of side length 1, Robbie Fleischman? I think you should draw it and then divide it into squares of side length 1 and count them. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much that's exactly what you do. You can just say, all right, you square of side length 3, let me just like split you up into um, pieces or whatever, and now, okay, each of these being a square of side length 1 has like 1, and then you just add them up so you just get 9. Impressed? I don't know. Okay. Um, what else? What's the next simplest object? Uh, what's up? Rectangle. Yeah, rectangle. How about just like rectangle, right? I mean, rectangle is just like a, you know, similar kind of thing, I guess, right? If this is three and this is five, this is like zoom, zoom, and then you can like split it up, and there's like 15, okay. All right, things get a little bit more complicated if you want to put, uh, like, you know, if, this, if the side length of the rectangle is like three and a half or something like that, then it's like not totally obvious what you're supposed to do. So uh, it's not like we're not, we're, not, we're not doing this completely as much as they would in like a geometry class, but hopefully in some sort of point in your lives, you had some fifth grade teacher or whatever who like had you play with like squares and tilings, and this is kind of the intuitive sense of area. All right. Um, Calvin, once we're not up on the areas of squares and rectangles, like what comes next, like logically speaking, maybe? Triangles. Yeah, triangles. And specifically, what's the easiest kind of triangle to find the area of? Yeah. A right, a right triangle. Uh, why is it so easy if I give you a right triangle with side lengths A, uh, with legs A and B, why is it so easy to find the area of this? A is a height. Yeah, but before you know the formula or whatever, based on the old stuff, you just shout something out, Shivani. Yeah, you can just like really, you can just like think of every uh, right triangle as just like half of like a rectangle. And if I already know how to find the area of a rectangle, then uh, well, then there's probably some like axiom of area or something like that, which says like you know two figures if they're congruent must have the same area. So to the extent that I know the area of the full thing and these two are congruent, then I know the area of this must be half that. So that's how we find. Is this making sense? All right, Ethan, what, what next? Or someone else, what next? Oh, once I have right triangles, what about if I have, what about if you give me like a non-right triangle? Do it with your finger. Yeah, everyone should be doing this. Yeah, you just drop a perpendicular. Ta-da! Two right triangles. Problem solved. So check, check. All right, so I don't know, what, what's left? Uh, what else can I find in the area besides like triangles and rectangles and stuff? A circle. More things. Before we get to that, what's easy? What else is easy? I mean, just the rest of like the boring things. Yeah. What? Other polygons. Trapezoids. Yeah, I could do like trapezoids and stuff. Um, because like trapezoids are just like trapezoids are just like right triangles and, and rectangles and like probably like probably like parallelograms and stuff like that. 
Um, worst parallelogram ever. Um, yeah, like rhombus, like blah, 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 blah. In fact, just like any polygon. Um, so here's like a polygon uh, or whatever. Uh, once I can find the area of triangles, then I can basically in principle find the area of any polygon. Because any polygon is, um, is decomposable into triangles. And you probably even did, you might have some memory of doing this problem with Giles last year, like when you guys were doing like law of, law of cosines, law of sines unit, where he probably like gave you some polygon and gave you like, um, um. like sufficient information to determine the figure with like some certain number of sides and angles and stuff, and then you had to like split it up and you like did the law of cosines like over and over and over again and like storing it in your calculator as you go, not if you have some memory of this, and you eventually just like solve the whole polygon you've been here. All right, so uh, basically polygons like done. Um, this is all elementary, okay, besides the trig factor, which is a little bit hard. Um, anyone can do this. Um, when does it get kind of weird? When does it get hard? Circles. Circles are hard. How do you find the area of a circle? Um, this is tricky. Um, what makes this one, what makes this tricky? Doesn't have, doesn't have corners. Yeah, doesn't have corners. No sides. Um, yeah, it's just not the 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 previous techniques which I have outlined here involving decomposing the figure into smaller figures whose area I already know. That method is like somehow not going to work, right? Because I just can't split a circle up into triangles because uh, it's just not a polygon. And in fact, like, what kind of like, I don't know, someone talk to me. Like, how do you feel about this problem? Like, it's like, what? I just do this in middle school, by the way. They just gave us a formula. Oh, I'm so sad. <laughs> I cry. Yeah, Colin, say something. You like cut it up into like pie slices and then reverse it each way so it made a shape similar to a rectangle, and then you're supposed yeah. to like, assume it was kind Ooh. of like. Yeah, it sounds like Calvin um, got a good education. Um, <laughs> Calvin, um, what's going on here is um, there's some like infinity going on here. That's kind of my opinion about what's going on here. Um, a circle already, once you're talking about a circle, it does sound like Captain Gravity Fleischmann, and as I have told you, once infinity is involved and you start dealing with infinity, you're pretty much doing calculus. So the way, if you are a seventh grade geometry teacher, to, to teach the area of a circle is to do basically fake calculus, or sometimes I call it baby calculus, or fake calculus. And what we kind of, the way, the, there's many ways of thinking about how infinity is involved here. One way is just that um, a circle is kind of just like a, it's just like a polygon with an infinite number of sides. I don't know if you already think about a circle that way. That's how I think about a circle. It's like a billion. Uh, it's like a billion gone, basically. Um, and uh, so, uh, how would I, if it were actually a billion gone, then how would I? Um, how would I do it? I mean, Sandeep, what would I do? If it were actually a billion gone, into a billion triangles, right? Yeah. So let's just do the same thing. But instead of a billion triangles, we'll do an infinite number of triangles. All right. Um, so let's. Start with eight first, because it's pretty close to infinity. Um, so uh, we'll do exactly what Calvin said. And by the way, if you've never seen this before, um, this is awesome. I don't know, I just, if you haven't seen this before, I just wonder what you learned in middle school. But um, take a scroll. Split up to eight sectors, and now these. Now the problem is these aren't triangles. They are not triangles. Okay. It's true. <laughs> It is true that they are not triangles. They are, they are sectors. And I don't know how to find the area of a sector either, by the way. But now, I do this following brilliant move. Um, I just go, jump. 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 Captain, this is what you were talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Now I have this thing, which kind of looks like what, ish? It's like kind of rectangle-ish, right? It kind of looks like a rectangle, sort of, maybe. Um, and it looks like a rectangle uh, in which, like, what's the height-ish? Roughly speaking, of this sort of kind of rectangle-ish. Yeah, this is kind of like the radius, right? I mean, roughly speaking, the height of this is more or less like the radius. And um, how about this uh, length of this uh, sort, of, sort of rectangle thing? Yeah, it is half the circumference, and um, we know uh, that uh, we know that the circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter. In in fact, that's just the definition of pi. Um, pi is just defined to be 
the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of any circle. So just like fact of geometry, all circles are similar uh, to each other, and since all circles are similar, the ratio between the circumference and the diameter is fixed, and that fixed number is, is the number pi. Um, so if the circumference is pi times the diameter, then and this is these like half the these like bumpy things when you add them up, that's just gonna be half the circumference. So this is just gonna be pi r. Whoa. Pi times or r times pi r. Pi r squared. OMG. OMG. So, Sydney, <laughs> uh, the thing is, this is not actually a rectangle, but now is where we do the fake calculus part. And the fake calculus part says, well, let's not stop at eight uh, of these uh, sectors. Let's go to like, you know, 16, 32, 100, a million. And every time I divide this up more and more uh, in, a, in a more sort of, um, into more and more pieces, and when I decompose it further, then do you guys kind of like feel this? thing, which is, doesn't quite look like a rectangle, now it's going to get more and more rectangle looking, right? These bumpy parts are going to get less bumpy. In fact, to me, this thing, which is a sector, once I, once I split it up into sort of like infinitely many pieces, whatever that means, then they are going to pretty much become triangles, right? Not exactly triangles, but pretty, pretty much triangles, because this curvy part is going to be like not so curvy when I put it together. So um, if you allow me to split this up into an infinite number of pieces, whatever that means, um, and match it all up, then it's going to become exactly a rectangle, and then there will be exactly pi squared. Uh, Raise your hand if you've seen this before. Oh, well, I like that. Okay, that's good. Okay. Faith restored. Um, all right. Um, blah 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 blah. Um, all right. So let's like let's like think about what happened here. Um, Stephen, this is pretty hard, right? Um, so it's okay. I can be behind the camera. Um, oh, I, did we forget to do introductions? We can do. I just forgot. We'll do it in a minute. Um, so, uh, so this is, um, this required, here's the thing about this proof. Um, this proof required ingenuity. Like, we had to be pretty smart, right? Yeah. And in the rest of your geometry class, you did a whole bunch of other proofs, which also required you to be pretty smart. Um, and, for example, uh, in class, you, like, derived the formula for, like, I don't know, like, the volume of, like, a cone, and you define, you derived the formula for, the volume of a sphere, and the surface area of a sphere, and the surface area of a cone, and all these things are like hard, right? Um, like pretty hard. I don't know what you guys did in your geometry class, but like the you you do all these proofs follow the this kind of baby calculus format where you sort of decompose it and rearrange it in some kind of like innovative way. Um, at some point though, it starts getting really, really, really hard. Like maybe I want to find the area of an ellipse. I see no obvious way to do that, um, you know, more, maybe there is an obvious way, I don't know. What if I want to find the area of like a, what if I have a parabolic uh, arch? So what if I have like, a, this is supposed to be like a, these are like bricks or whatever. Okay, getting tired of drawing it well. Um, so you have like a parabolic arch, and what you would like to know is um, exactly uh, how much area fits under this parabolic arch, because you want to like march your like army through it or something. I don't know. You want to just know how much area fits under here. Maybe it's upside down and it's actually like a um, like a like a like a viaduct and you'd like to know the cross sectional area so you can figure out how much water is gonna flow through it per day. Yes? Isn't there like some famous arch? I forget what the name is. There are lots of famous arches, like in St. Louis? Yeah. Yes, not a problem though. But um okay. but um so uh, so, so I'd like to find the area inside this arc. Okay, um, Arun, we learned in logic math that there is actually a way to calculate the area inside a parabola. And in fact, this was done by Archimedes, uh, ancient Greek mathematician in the in a sort of like late late uh, ancient Greece period. So in fact, this area problem I should just mention. This is like an ancient problem. All these formulas for volumes of spheres and 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 and, and, and cylinders and things like that. These were all solved in ancient times. Um, so you can actually find the area under a parabola, but it's really, really hard. It's so hard. It's so bad. Um, it involves this extremely complex and convoluted um, advanced geometric argument in which you have like similar triangles and you do some, you do some kind of like uh, baby calculus uh, sort of thing and you eventually get it, but it's like so hard. All right, so but the thing is, um, so all right, so this is, so the, the area problem at the moment is Yo, I want to be able to find the area under everything. Not just these, not just this particular group of geometric objects, but I would like to find the area 
underneath a cubic function, for example, maybe, or whatever, right? So this, this area problem. All right. Um, we're going to pause the area problem for a minute, and we're going to talk about the other problem again. Um, so this is the other problem of calculus. I feel like you need to go back, back 10 feet. I just, I mean, you can play around, but... It's good. Um, so, all right, here's the other, here is the other problem of calculus. The other problem of calculus is uh, the tangent line problem. All right, um, so what is this all about? Uh, let's do, um, so let's tell a story. Suppose that we are traveling uh, from DC to New York City. And we are going to do this, oh, and let's just suppose for simplicity's sake that this trip is uh, 240 miles and that it's going to take, it takes us precisely, uh, it takes us precisely four hours. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, is roughly how long it should take you to get to New York. It's not how long it's like, like four. Or five hours to no, it's like four and a half. It's like four if you leave. If you leave, yeah, there's like, there's, there's like no traffic. If there's no traffic, you can do it in four hours. Um, so, uh, okay, simple question. Uh, how, what was the speed of this trip? Well, let me ask the whole class so everyone can participate. What is the speed, what was the speed of this trip? So six, six miles per hour. Six miles per hour. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, so speed uh, equals uh, six miles per hour, and like that's just right. That's just um, that's just that's like a fifth grade problem, right? Uh, the speed is sixty. <laughs> the speed is six miles per hour. If I went if I went this many miles and took me this many hours, then this is how fast I was going. Um, all right. Um, but this is actually kind of crap, right? Like, what? what explain. Someone talk to me. What's going on here? Yeah, Laura. That's the average speed. Yeah, my question was kind of like vague, right? It was like very vague, some, so vague that some of you might have even been like disgusted with this question. Um, but uh, yeah, the the question that I really should have asked if I was going to do this more uh, carefully is what was the average speed? So Laura wants to remind us that what we have actually calculated was um, was average uh, speed. And um, you know, when we say that our speed was 60 miles per hour, we certainly don't mean, or we probably don't mean, that uh, we were going 60 miles per hour for the entire trip. So, I mean, that's like not even possible, right? Most trips like start with you, you know, like at zero miles per hour because you're in your driveway <laughs> or whatever, and you probably have to stop for for lights and holes. Other cars sometimes are in the way; they're like in front of you. All right. Um, so, uh, Laura, what is average speed? Can you just remind, can you just remind us of what is, can I get like a definition of average speed? Um, it's like the amount of time, the amount of time that it takes. Uh, uh, Calvin. Total uh, distance over total time. Yeah, that's all I was looking for. Um, total distance, yeah, that's just kind of what, that's just kind of what average speed means, right? Total distance.